We all think we know American history, but half-truths and legends often cloud the real story. Take the drama of the first moon landing. Think Neil and Buzz never flirted with disaster? Think again. Without a felt-tip pen, they might never have splashed down back home. And what about Air Force One, that other slice of flying Americana? Don't buy that it's just the president's aerial taxi. It was once tricked out as a spy plane, armed with high-tech cameras straight out of a Bond movie. I'm Jamie Kaler, and Houston, we still got a problem. It's time to untangle the myths from the real story. The idea of walking on the moon has tantalized mankind ever since Homo erectus straightened up enough to stare at the night sky. In 1969, that crazy dream finally came true. It was a $25 billion project piloted by three space jocks with the right stuff, each earning the astronomical sum of $17,000 a year. Their moonwalk was a stunning achievement for humanity, except that the story we're familiar with is light years away from what really happened. Everyone thinks they know the story of these three brave astronauts who went to the moon and it was all daring and brave and heroic and wonderful. But that is just one narrative in so many. And there's so many things that you don't know that went on. The version we're familiar with goes like this. In 1961, a young president with high ideals sets a lofty goal. Put a man on the moon before the decade ends. NASA, a nexus of aeronautic talent and snazzy crew cuts, is eager to get on board. On July 16th, 1969, Apollo 11 lifts off with Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins. We're about to win the space race leaving the Soviets to eat our lunar dust. The lunar lander floats easily down to the moon's surface. The TV images aren't great, but it's the best NASA can deliver. The astronauts blast off from the moon again without a hitch, leaving the proud American flag where it stands to this day, right? There are so many myths in that account that they could fill a moon crater, beginning with JFK's real motives for going to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. But in spite of his inspiring words, the truth is that Kennedy was far from starstruck about space. Listen to this recently released dialogue between Kennedy and the head of NASA in 1962. Everything that we do ought to really be tied into getting onto the moon and ahead of the Russians. Otherwise, we shouldn't be spending this kind of money because I'm not that interested in space. Yes, you heard that right. Going to the moon wasn't a lofty ideal for Kennedy. It was a strategic power play here on Earth. He was interested in beating the Soviets in whatever it took. The whole thing really was about the Cold War. It's all about we're being beaten in space by the Russians, and I need a goal that neither of us can do, but we have a fair shot at winning. It had nothing to do with anything but needing to beat the adversary in this new field. Three. Two, one, zero. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. And what about the idea that we're so far ahead in the space race that the boys at Mission Control are thumbing their noses at the Kremlin? The truth is, the space race is down to the wire. Just three days before Apollo 11's liftoff, the Soviets launched their own lunar lander, the Luna 15, and it's scheduled to touch down on the moon hours before the NASA team does. The Soviet spacecraft is unmanned, but if it achieves its mission, bringing back a lunar soil sample before Apollo 11's return, it will be a devastating blow to NASA and a resounding Soviet victory in the tense Cold War. They'd be able to say, we don't need to send people. We can just pick this stuff up by robot. And had it been able to work before Apollo 11 and got back a couple of hours earlier, the Russians would have had a pretty nice propaganda coup on their hands. But as Luna 15 comes in for landing, it's clear the Soviet gear isn't quite ready for prime time. 
the lunar probe wasn't prepared to deal with the moon's topography, all these mountains and valleys and all this variation. Its altimeter was giving it all these wacky readings that it ended up smashing into the moon's surface on the 21st, right around when Armstrong and Aldrin were walking on the moon. A photo finish. How crazy is it that an object which has floated around the Earth for billions of years ends up getting its first two visitors from Earth within hours of each other? Anyway, our moon landing comes off without a hitch. All smooth sailing. Quite the opposite. It starts with a malfunction in the lunar lander's autopilot system that sends the Eagle four miles off course. But Armstrong and Aldrin are too busy to notice because they've got a second glitch on their hands. The navigation computer's alarm is sounding. Its memory is overloaded. The computer they had was basically something that could barely power a watch today. It had about 72K of memory, which is about the amount you have on a moderate-sized JPEG image you might get in your email. When Armstrong finally takes a peek out the Eagle's window, he sees he's headed for a crater filled with boulders the size of Buicks. He instantly takes semi-automatic control. You now had to use the spacecraft almost like a helicopter, use up a lot of fuel and move over the surface, desperately trying to find a smooth enough place to land the spacecraft. Before Apollo 11's launch, Armstrong put the odds of a successful landing at only 50-50. Now, with time and fuel rapidly running out, those odds are getting worse by the second. The only call outs from now on will be fuel. 60. 60 seconds. He was flying under the dead man's curve. This is a point where if somehow the engine decided to stop, he wouldn't have enough time to punch the abort button, have the ascent stage separate from the spacecraft and get out of Dodge. They would have crashed. Armstrong continues to descend, desperately hoping for the flat terrain he needs to land safely. Four forward, forward drifting to the right level. 30. 30 seconds. Half. 30 seconds. Low level. Low level. Finally, he sees his spot. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And touches down with just seconds of fuel remaining. Roger, Tranquility. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. If the fictions we've exposed so far have left you moonstruck. How is the quality of the TV? Oh, it's beautiful, Mike. It really is. Wait till we give you the clear picture about that murky video seen around the world. Half a billion people were glued to their TVs when the Apollo 11 astronauts set foot on the moon. Now, with that many couch potatoes watching, you'd think that we'd have every fact straight. But even with a global audience, history still has a knack for painting the wrong picture. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Speaking of the wrong picture, Let's start with NASA's iconic video of the moon landing. Like the um, secondary strut. Everyone assumes the images are so dim and murky because that was the best quality possible in 1969. So get this. The pictures beamed from the moon to NASA are bright and clear and vivid. The picture was great. But it was in a format that uh, broadcast television couldn't support at the time. So instead of trying to figure out some way to convert it, they just took the camera and pointed it at the monitor. So what you're seeing is apparently a video of a video, which really degrades the footage. And if we had that original magnetic tape, the things we could do with that digitally now, it would be like we were standing on the moon there with them. Oh, geez, that's great. Is the lighting halfway decent? Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes. The shocking truth is that no one will probably ever get to see those clean video images again. Short-sighted engineers most probably recycled them to record later missions. So chances are, they're lost forever. And you're clear for takeoff. And what about the Eagle's liftoff from the moon? That goes fine and dandy, right? Not even close. Once back inside the lunar lander, the astronauts discover another, potentially deadly problem. They'd broken a switch on the ascent engine arming breaker without noticing when suiting up for their moonwalk over three hours earlier. They put on these giant backpacks with all their life support and stuff, and the lunar module's not big. So between the two of them maneuvering out, walking around, someone knocked the switch off a breaker. 
and it turned out that was the engine arming switch. And without that engine on, they wouldn't have got off the surface. With both the mission and their lives at stake, they rack their brains for a solution. Meanwhile, back on Earth, President Nixon is secretly prepared for the possibility that the two astronauts may never make it home. His speechwriter, William Sapphire, has written a contingency address. So there was actually a speech for Nixon to read in the event that the astronauts would be stranded on the moon. These brave men, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, know that there is no hope for their recovery. But they also know that there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. Fortunately for the astronauts and for history, they find the simplest of solutions in the middle of their high-tech space chariot. Buzz Aldrin was diligently taking notes on this sudden problem that could have meant his doom with a felt tip marker and realized that the marker actually fit in the switch. So Buzz says that the only way that he could really push the circuit breaker in was using his pen. And that pen was enough to get current going to that engine and they were able to launch. So they blast off for their return to Earth. And as they look back at the moon, they can see the American flag standing proud and tall. The flag on Apollo 11 was blown over by the ascent engine thrust when they took off from the moon. It just goes BAM! In fact, Buzz sees the flag fall over as they take off, but he doesn't broadcast that on his triumphant return. And he made the right call, because even though it's important to know the facts, the fiction that the stars and stripes are still upright on the moon is too good to give up. There's no cooler plane on the planet than Air Force One. It pretty much has to be, since it's tailor-made to transport the most powerful person in the world. But it's time to separate the reality from the excess baggage. Air Force One isn't just the president's Cadillac. It's a symbol of American dignity, power, and prestige. It's an aircraft of peace, but Beneath its Clark Kent exterior is a super aerial tank. It can deploy lasers that can torch an enemy's supersonic anti-aircraft missiles. If enemy planes get too close for comfort, onboard heat-seeking missiles will give them a presidential greeting they'll never forget. For any remaining threats, there's always the cleverly hidden wing-mounted machine guns. And if the bad guys still manage to run that fearsome gauntlet and send Air Force One plummeting, no worries. The president can bail out in his armored escape pod. Really cool, right? Sorry, but I have to slam on the brakes right there. Air Force One has no offensive weapons, not one. People assume it's armed to the teeth because the president deserves the best protection the U.S. military can dish out. But the truth is that arming Air Force One is a very bad idea, since that could incite enemies to attack it. And this business of an escape pod, that's all Hollywood. Largely because of the Harrison Ford movie, a lot of people think that it has an escape pod on it. That's not the way it works. It's like a commercial aircraft in that if something would go wrong, it's the pilot's job to get that plane down safely. The president can't get out, there's no parachutes for him. The president shouldn't have to do any skydiving from Air Force One. Because the fact is that while Air Force One doesn't have any offensive weapons, it does come equipped with some pretty cool high-tech defensive countermeasures. Flare and chaff launchers mounted above each of the four jet engines and under the fuselage can deflect heat-seeking missiles, even from shoulder-mounted weapons fired at close range. There's also a skin on the plane designed to ward off electromagnetic pulses in the case of a nuclear attack. Just more proof that the real story can be a lot cooler than the Hollywood version. But one thing we can all agree on, the name of this plane is Air Force One. Air Force One is not a plane. It's actually the radio call sign attached to the plane the president is flying on. When the president isn't aboard, the plane is referenced by its tail number. It only becomes Air Force One when the president steps on board. 
It works the same way every time the president travels by air. When he boards his Marine helicopter at the White House, it's designated Marine One. If he hitches a ride on a Navy plane, it's called Navy One. And there hasn't yet been a Coast Guard one. This name game all started after a near mid-air collision almost brought down the president's aircraft. In 1953, Dwight Eisenhower's plane is at cruising altitude, and air traffic controllers identify it like they did all planes, by its tail number, 8610. The only problem? Eastern Airlines Flight 8610 is just a few clouds over. The similarity of the names creates confusion, and both planes are directed toward the same spot in the sky. At the last minute, Ike's pilot realizes he's headed for a disaster and makes a quick course correction but it's a dangerously close call. Air traffic controllers of the time were referring to the two planes interchangeably using the same tail number. They anticipated that it could be a problem at some time, so they came up with this idea of Air Force One. Since it has no offensive weapons, it makes sense that Air Force One has only been used for diplomatic missions. Except for that time it was tricked out as a high-tech spy plane. The year is 1959. The Cold War threatens to thaw out and boil over. So Eisenhower makes plans to fly to Moscow to cool down the escalating tensions. But secretly, CIA officials decide to take advantage of what they see as a golden opportunity. Somebody at the CIA came up with this idea, well, why don't we put spy cameras on the president's plane so that when he flies over the Soviet Union, we can take pictures of every square inch of his route. So maybe we can get pictures of the anti-missile defenses around Moscow. The CIA calls the operation Project Lida Rose. Its operatives plant high-tech cameras near the 707's wheel wells. Insiders say they can read a license plate from 29,000 feet. A lot of people felt that Eisenhower didn't even know about this. Some people think that's sort of strange credulity, but basically, uh, the CIA was ready to go. The elaborate plan is designed to work even if a Soviet navigator happens to be riding shotgun in the cockpit. Hidden camera controls allow the co-pilot to snap photos without raising any suspicions, while the president's plane pulls off the intelligence raid of the century. The secret operation gets torpedoed in May 1960, when the Soviets shoot down another CIA spy plane. Gary Powers, U-2. That destroyed any hopes for any kind of agreement between the U.S. and the Soviets and ended Eisenhower's trip to the Soviet Union. So we never got there, and the supposed surveillance gear on the president's plane was never used. Air Force One's stint as a spy plane shows how the facts you accept as gospel can sometimes hit major turbulence. And if you think Air Force One has always looked as classy as this, fasten your seatbelt, because we're headed for a dizzying tailspin. One of the biggest facts about Air Force One that most people get wrong is that there's only one plane. The president actually has two customized 747s, one hardtop and one convertible. Okay, they're both hardtops. In case one has a problem, the other is always available. But wherever they go, they're designed to make a statement about American power and prestige. You'd never guess that this national symbol of presidential class and authority evolved from this. This eyesore with wings is Harry Truman's presidential plane, Independence. The garish paint scheme is intended to make the Douglas DC-9 look like a flying eagle. And it comes complete with tail feathers, a beak, and cockpit windows where the eagle's eyes would be. The Independence not only screams out that Harry has rotten taste, but also how hard he was trying to look presidential. Easy to see why, since he seems like such an average Joe compared to his predecessor, the flamboyant Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt was this iconic leader, so Truman felt that he had something to prove. So he wanted the plane to be designed so everybody knew Harry Truman was aboard. And boy, did they ever. The independence attracts plenty of notice, but not necessarily the kind Truman's hoping for. One Air Force One pilot, Colonel Ralph Albertazzi, called it a gaudy airplane, more likely to be mistaken for a flying circus than a flying White House. 
Air Force One's image doesn't get much of a boost when Eisenhower succeeds Truman. I explains the Columbine 2 and the Columbine 3 drab up the skies with a Spartan military look and splashes of high visibility orange paint. Any guesses which administration finally gives Air Force One the makeover that transforms it into the beloved icon it is today? Yes, John and Jackie Kennedy do everything with style, including reimagining America's presidential plane as a national treasure. But the credit for Air Force One's classy color scheme and markings really goes to the slick marketing expert the Kennedys hire. Renowned industrial engineer Raymond Lowy. He was a gifted image maker who also gives the world the Ritz Crackers logo and the iconic Lucky Strike packaging design. And his vision is the Air Force One we cherish today. Hues of blue, white, and silver, along with the simple designation, United States of America. But credit JFK for showing future presidents how to take full advantage of this flying icon. He sort of invented that arrival and departure ceremony that so many people are familiar with today. And he made a big deal out of that. And he was very smart to do that because to this day, Air Force One still has a mystique, and Kennedy recognized that. As much as Air Force One became a flying symbol of Camelot, it also becomes the epicenter of its abrupt and tragic end. The irony of Kennedy and Air Force One is that his glamour first imprints Air Force One on the public mind, and then his death tragically serves the same purpose. Since that terrible day, American presidents have traveled the equivalent of 18 round trips to the moon aboard Air Force One. Knowing the real story, the failures, as well as the successes, makes our history more interesting and a lot more heroic. Which is why facts are so much better than fiction.